Uh, so now we have uh, some time for discussion. Uh, let me just uh, note that uh, it seems to me from uh, the different uh, uh, presentations that uh, when we speak about uh, communications, credibility of central banks, uh, perhaps we are discussing two different things. One uh, has to do with uh, what uh, Lesedia mentioned as uh, communicating about the uh, central bank as an institution which uh, would be necessary for any institution, but in the case of central banks, it's uh, special uh, to the extent that many of our central banks are independent. So explaining why an institution uh, has to be independent and what are the uh, limits that that sets on what uh, that institution can do, I think it's, a, it's a, an important challenge. And, uh, and uh, given the full extent of uh, responsibilities of central banks, I think that that's uh, a, an issue in itself. Of course, uh, one thing is uh, uh, to explain uh, uh, that. Uh, quite another is uh, to what extent that may permeate into the way in which monetary policy is understood uh, and how far that uh, allows the central bank to have uh, to gain credibility for monetary policy as such uh, and uh, to help uh, guide the expectations. So uh, then there is that second part of the, on the discussion of, on communication that is communicating mon monetary policy. Uh, and uh, there I think that the, the point that uh, uh, Karnit uh, said at the, uh, at the beginning, how to convey, uh, convey uncertainty and limited knowledge uh, 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 she uh, uh, poses it as part of transparency itself. So it's not a, a, a problem that we have to deal with. It's uh, perhaps very central to what we mean by, by uh, transparency and what may, may, we may want to communicate. Now the challenge is how do you can communicate that uh, you don't make uh, decisions over full certainty of things uh, to uh, what extent uh, you uh, make decisions on limited knowledge, especially when you're looking forward, uh, uh, we're looking in, into the future of uh, the economy. So um, perhaps with that, we can open the floor for uh, comments and questions to the panel. Yes, please. Thank you, Governor Marcel. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, um, be invited to uh, attend this conference. I find it's very thoughtful and instructive, partic particularly regarding the central bank's uh, independence and uh, communication. And from uh, the whole day's uh, speaker's introduction and also now uh, for governor's introduction about the experiences in U.S. Federal Reserve, Bank of England, and their respective other four central banks' experience, and how to enhance the transparency, and uh, how to communicate it with the um, public eff uh, effectively. Uh, second, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to give a brief introduction about how the People's Bank of China communicate with the public. Generally speaking, there are about uh, six channels for the People's Bank of China to uh, communicate with the public. Uh, number one, uh, we publish a monetary policy report quarterly. The monetary policy, policy report includes the most read and the monetary policy decisions and the analysis of inflation and the money supply change as well as the Chinese microeconomic outlook. Moreover, the columns included in the MPR will also provide some forward-looking analysis on very hot issues. Second, press release and regular meetings of the Mon Monetary Policy Committee. Since the People's Bank of China held its first monetary policy meeting in 1997, it has maintained this meeting on a quarterly basis. The PBC will publish the press release following the meeting on the website. 
keeping the public informed of the main information. Third, speeches delivered by the head and the senior officials of the People's Bank of China. The governor, deputy governors, and other senior officials of People's Bank of China will usually give speeches at public meetings or international financial conferences, which usually communicate the policy stance of the People's Bank of China. Fourth, open market operation notices. Since 2016, the People's Bank of China has been published has been publishing daily notices to better explain, explain the rational for open market operations. Fifth, press conferences are sometimes scheduled after policy announcements to further explain the rational for important decisions. Last but not the least, the People's Bank of China is committed to providing more timely information while social media, such as Weibo, uh, the so-called China's Twitter equivalent, as mentioned by some professor this morning, and also WeChat, which is a very uh, timely information. According to the research by the IMF, the People's Bank of China attracts greater attention among its social media followers compared with other major central banks. Now we are still in the process of improving how to more effectively communicate with the public and enhance our transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman uh, <coughs> across the aisle. Uh, thank you, governors. Thank you, governors. Uh, my question is about central bank independence and uh, follow-up question would be on communication. Central bank independence has become the subject of active discussion and debate lately. What is the meaning of central bank independence? Does it mean absolute independence, operational independence, restrained independence, or it is implicit independence given to them? My understanding is that unlike Chile and ECB, most central banks, they do not incorporate in their charter independence you see, uh, explicitly. Uh, they get the mandates in their uh, charters. So based on their mandates, can we uh, derive that central banks, they have the operational independence? Because nowadays, politicking and uh, interference from the executive branch has become so pronounced that central bankers, they, I think you see, they feel they are on the defensive. Uh, does this mean that central banks would commit um, the policy of, I think, is it compromising under pressure from the public and uh, from the government and from the markets? Uh, when it comes to communication, what is communication taper tantrum we have seen? Was that a miscommunication in 2013, which created, you see, problems for emerging markets? So what should be the communication? Uh, do what you say and say what you do, or it should be more than that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, there is a hand uh, on the back there. Uh, yeah, the lady. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. So um, we've been hearing about the role of the central banks, uh, mostly on the challenges in the current environment. So I wanted to pose a question looking forward on how do you assess the challenge uh, brought by the rise of digital currencies? Um, for instance, in areas such as the monetary policy transmission and the role of the central bank as a lender of last resort, just to name a few areas. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have a mic over here. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, my question is about um, other non-monetary policy issues that some central banks think that they should address. I'm thinking particularly about Mark Carney giving the speech about the importance of climate change and the fact that the Bank of England now has a whole division or group just looking at that. Other issues are inequality. And so my question is, do you think that that central bank should, um, should weigh in on those subjects? Thank you. 
Um, one quick question for um, Governor Echeverria on the experience of Colombia. Um, I found interesting what you said that, that interest rate surprises are larger in Colombia than relative other countries like Chile. And I wonder what do you think could be the reason for it, especially you say when you compare it with Chile, who has similar exposure to commodity shocks and maybe, I mean, not exactly the same, but similar size, exposure to financial markets and so on. Um, could that have anything to do with the fact that uh, foreign exchange interventions and, uh, is stronger in Colombia, and so there's more resistance maybe to the free-floating behavior? And that, in a sense, I'm linking to the paper that we presented this, earlier this morning, whether the fear of flooding is fully overcome in Colombia or not, and whether the consequences of it to get more interest rate volatility. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one uh, last uh, there in the back, and then we go to the panel. So, I just want to piggyback on Mike Bordo's question. I mean, as central banks are perceived as trusted institutions, and we're we're being asked to take on more and more roles. Isn't there a tension between our ability to communicate clearly all these different roles and at the same time um, give simplified messages? I appreciate the, the quite nice narrative from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, but it just seems like our lives are getting more complicated. And at the same time, we want to drive towards simpler communication. And it just seems there's a, a tension building between those two, those two uh, directions. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, a set of uh, questions and comments to go back to the panel. So perhaps we can start in the opposite order with uh, Adrian. Are we on? We are. Um, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I, I'll try and uh, my best to answer a few with with a reasonably simple statement. I. I um, for a start, a lot of central banks are different. Not, not everyone has the financial stability, or I should say prudential regulatory role as a financial stability. So um, uh, just in a short answer to uh, uh, Michael Bordeaux, I mean, I think climate change uh, is playing a very critical role to financial stability in a lot of countries and a uh, role of a central bank and our position, who is the prudential regulator, really does have to understand whether the insurance market is thinking smart enough. Um, if you can't insure a house, you won't be able to mortgage a house. Uh, there will be financial instability very quickly. You can draw very direct lines from climate change through to, through to our core purpose. On the wider discussion around operation, uh, independence, uh, I view it as narrow. We are goal dependent i.e. our purpose is described by our public. We, uh, uh, governments are voted in and some of them have specific purposes for central banks which are becoming more and more generic globally. So they are becoming, um, looking more and more similar. But so we are not independent, we are dependent in our purpose for existing. We are then operationally independent for some aspects of that work. And most of that work is primarily related to low and stable inflation. As soon as you start deviating from that, your operational independence gets more complex. And also as you come into this low nominal interest rate environment and um, uh, non-normal, I forget the term, it's probably normal monetary policy, the, the fiscal authorities and other regulatory authorities are highly interdependent with what we are doing. And so that is again where the maturity of communication, the maturity of understanding uh, where your true mana, which is your operational independence, exists and being open and being able to ask and work with the other authorities is critical. And I would say that is definitely the case with fiscal authorities at present. Uh, in the absence of good dialogue and, and proper communication, between those authorities, uh, monetary policy quickly runs out of friends. And on, on the last part around being asked to do many things, uh, I think any central bank should say no if it's not related to their purpose. 
um, at the widest point, our purpose is to promote a, a productive and sustainable economy um, through the various uh, tools that we have. Uh, and part of that financial stability does bring in more complex areas. So there is a tension of more stories to tell, but it doesn't mean we have to tell them all in the one document or all by the same person. And this is the communication challenge that I think um, the central banks are having to, um, to face and evolve into. I would say our central bank did a relatively poor job. We went inward and introverted and found ourselves isolated, not independent. And that's when things can move on you quickly. That is why um, a lot of the legislation ended up in Parliament um, to a good outcome, but not invited by the central bank. Thank you. Um, well, first, first of all, on, on, policies or, on policy surprises, um, it's not intervention because we have, we have not intervened for the last uh, five years at all. Um, so my guess is, first of all, that, the, that uh, policy rates increase a lot and decrease a lot. So it's much more difficult to communicate analysts and economic, uh, uh, markets what you are going to do. Uh, the other thing is that um, we, we decided to, wh when, when there were increasing rates or decreasing rates, it was not just one after the other. So we decreased once, we stopped. We so it's very difficult to communicate. But, but my guess also is that we have to prepare markets better for what we have to do. So we have to learn a lot how to communicate people more or less the, the way we'll go in the future. So that's one thing. On income distribution and the environment, well, my experience will say, no, don't go that way. Um, one month ago, well, I was looking at some surveys in Colombia about uh, um, determinants of investment. W one of the determinants was, was uh, the polarized political climate in Colombia. So I mentioned that, and it was a huge mess. Uh, everybody was very angry about the central bank just talking about the survey. So <laughs> I will say, don't go <laughs> into uh, another, uh, other areas. Um, on, on the independence of the central bank, uh, at least in Colombia, and my guess that in many other countries that we, we go much, more further, much further than just operational um, delegation. For example, the central bank in Colombia determines the target. The central bank in Colombia determines if we float or not, or if we intervene. So it's not just that the government tell us and then we do it, it's much more. Um, I think it's very difficult to do otherwise, but uh, that's the Colombian experience. I'm going to sound Colombian. Um, I think that, um, the, the stuff about independence, as I had said earlier on, uh, it depends on the institutional setups in countries. So in the case of South Africa, our independence is hard-coded in the constitution of South Africa. So actually, before the constitution was written, we had to agree on certain constitutional principles against which the constitution must comply. And one of those was uh, the creation of an independent uh, independent central bank. We are an institution of state. So when we talk about independence, it's independence, but you are a state, uh, a state institution. That's the first point. The second point is that the mandate is also hard-coded in the constitution. It says that it is the protection of the currency in the interest of balanced and sustainable growth in the republic. And uh, understand the nuance. Um, it is an understanding that for you to have balanced and sustainable growth, you should have uh, actually a price, uh, a price stability. And there may be various interpretations of that clause of the concern. If you take it to its logical conclusion, that basically means that it is the central bank that should decide what price stability is. But the, at the time when we were introducing the framework, because the constitution does not prescribe what framework must be used for price stability. The decision that was taken was that we must go the route of an inflation uh, targeting a, a framework. 
And so the uh, governor approached the Minister of Finance and says, said that we can, I can do this thing, but I think that for the target to be credible, it is important that it has got wider societal uh, support. So after an interaction and the minister and the governor agreed on what the inflation target range should be, uh, it was tabled in parliament and it became uh, an agreed target in, uh, 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 in parliament. And so uh, that uh, uh, determines, uh, determines, uh, determines the extent. And I must say that even at our darkest hour where we thought our institutions were being undermined, I can't think of a president or a minister of finance who tried to tell the central bank what the monetary policy stance should be. Firstly, because the constitution would not have allowed it, uh, but secondly, because my two predecessors were very difficult characters and the politicians knew if you tell them to do one thing, they are likely to do the opposite. So the politicians didn't bother to try. So, so, so that was uh, the thing. So where did the attack came from? The attack came from a very unexpected quarter. And it had nothing to do with monetary policy. It had to do with a bank that failed in 1985. For the record, in 1985, I was in my first year at college. And I had to deal with that problem just two years ago. And uh, this um, uh, office of the ombuds, which was investigating a bank failure, which the bank had to deal with and resolve in 1985, came with an action that said that the way to avoid this thing in the future is to change the mandate of the central bank from uh, inflation, from price stability to the promotion of broader societal welfare, she called it. And the truth of the matter was that that bailout or that bank failure took place before the constitution was even written. So the attack came from a very unknown court, unexpected quarter, and we had to approach the courts and fight in the, uh, uh, in the courts. And uh, we had won the first round, the second round, and the third round was actually decided this morning, which we also won. And so we have that, uh, we have that behind us. So we have got legal certainty. And the reason why I kept on emphasizing that the big battle is not in the courts of law, it's in the courts of public opinion, and has to do with taking the entire society with us to understand the value proposition of an independent central bank. So how do you see these two incidents, uh, Turkey and India? Because they are, I think, you see, very recent heart from the pot, which we have seen. In one case, the governor was fired. In another case, the governor resigned out of, I think, you see, his own dignity. Yes, um, there is a certain decorum among central uh, bankers that we do not comment about each other's work. Uh, but let me say that I was faced with exactly that situation in 2017, where a question was asked as to whether I shouldn't resign. And my view was that I will not resign. And the reason why I said I will not resign was because the Constitution does not just give me independence. The Constitution says I must act independently without fear, favor, or prejudice. Resigning would have meant that I'm a coward and I'm running away. And I decided I am going to stay on and I am going to fight until I protect it. The institution is successfully pro uh, protected. And that is what we achieved. Uh, back to central bank independence, I think that uh, the fact that the memory of high inflation is slowly fading is the main reason why the recent st threats that we've seen to, uh, uh, to central bank independence. And I think uh, these memories and also the, uh, what happens in the countries where the in central uh, bank independence is threatened is a reminder 
uh, for the rest of us why it's so important to actually maintain central bank independence. In the case of Israel, it's the government who sets the exact, uh, who interprets what price stability is in terms of the quantitative uh, uh, target which is set by the government. The, it's the law which defines the mandate which is price stability, uh, subject to achieving price stability over the medium term also supporting uh, growth and employment, and also narrowing uh, social gaps. This addition, uh, additional goal is somewhat unusual, and it was a result of a compromise in the legislation process in 2010. I won't tell the whole story, but uh, the central bank did not think that it really has the tools to actually deal with uh, reducing uh, social gaps. However, the Bank of Israel, and that's relating to, an, to the question of the expanding role of uh, central banks to sort of non-core or non-traditional areas, such as climate change and inequality. The Bank of Israel has the unusual role of being also, or the governor is also the economic advisor to the government. Uh, and in this capacity, actually, we deal with policies of the central bank, I should say, I'm no longer the governor, uh, which I sometimes forget. Um, <laughs> The, uh, actually, the Bank of Israel also advises on issues such as climate change and uh, reducing social gaps and fiscal policy and things of that, um, of, of that sort. Uh, and it's, it's taking a longer, long term view at these policies. And that's somewhat in contrast to uh, many governments who tend to have somewhat shorter horizons. Uh, I should say that this uh, additional role of the central bank does increase the friction between the central bank and the government. It didn't imply any undermining of the independence in setting monetary policy, but it does increase the friction of the central bank. Uh, on the other side, I think the fact that the bank provides advice which is based on very sort of thorough uh, professional work actually increases the credibility of the central bank more broadly. So I think actually it's solidified in some way the credibility and maybe even the independence of the central bank in spite of dealing with uh, issues that are normally in the, are in the domain of the government. Thank you, Garnet. Um, and thank you all for, for your uh, responses and comments. I know that uh, the question on digital currencies uh, was not uh, addressed, but uh, we have uh, some time uh, left uh, uh, this evening and tomorrow to uh, deal with that. Uh, and let me just uh, uh, conclude by elaborating on one of the questions here that, uh, that uh, Garnet mentioned in the end which is uh, this issue of uh, central banks taking more roles. I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, today there may be a number of uh, threats to central bank independence. Uh, that doesn't mean that independent central banks are under siege everywhere. But the trickiest uh, threat to central bank independence is mission. I think that uh, uh, the notion that uh, because uh, central banks uh, may be reliable or serious or independent. Uh, they can be entrusted with uh, additional functions. It's a very complicated one. A very complicated one. Uh, essentially, because <coughs> an independent institution is not well endowed to deal with uh, uh, complex policy trade-offs and with uh, choices that uh, belong more to the political arena than to uh, a group of unelected officials. So it may be flattering that uh, people want uh, some time to add uh, some function to the central bank. But in the end, uh, that may uh, end up uh, being a, a big, uh, a big uh, problem. We dealt with that in Chile uh, only a few days ago when uh, there was a proposal for the central bank to uh, take up uh, the role of uh, 
<coughs> investment manager for pension funds uh, that uh, came out of a discussion of pension reform. And uh, we had uh, to deal with that, basically explaining openly to the public what uh, conflict of interest uh, would emerge from combining that with uh, the responsibilities over setting uh, the monetary policy rate or uh, doing uh, financial stability work. And uh, in the end, I think that, uh, that uh, worked well, being open in explaining that and why a central bank shouldn't take too many functions upon itself, because that would uh, end up being a threat to independence itself. Uh, so just uh, to share that example that is very recent in, in our experience, but uh, something that we uh, more or less uh, have had to deal with uh, in different uh, ways. So having said that, uh, I think that we can bring this uh, wonderful panel to a uh, close. Uh, I thank uh, I, uh, uh, my colleagues here for uh, traveling a long distance in the case of uh, Adrian and the city in particular. Can uh, uh, it also travel a long way to get to Santiago? And uh, I think it was uh, a, a, a great opportunity to have uh, views from central banks from different parts of the world, dealing with different institutional realities, but facing some common challenges that are part of uh, the agenda of this meeting. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, we invite you to join us for uh, a cocktail uh, right after this. Thank you. Thank you.